So, um, HomeKit uh, is something that they call domotics, which is about home automation. And um, it actually uh, has a long history um, being more about, uh, like starting with all the electric lights that we've enjoyed today. Uh, people have always been trying to make domestic work easier. So after electric lights, one of the major innovations that people thought about was washing machines because back in the old days to automate it, you needed a river and a big water wheel and it took um, giant machinery. But now starting in the early, um, early part of the 20th century, you could start having a machine in your own home. Um, the first instance really of computers being used for home automation seems to be a computer that might not have actually ever been sold, but in the 1968 Neiman Marcus catalog, the Honeywell Corporation sold a computer for $10,000 at that time, which is more like $68,000 today. And um, it uh, came with a two-week programming course so people could learn how to program their own recipes. Um, you can't see it super well, but basically, um, I don't think there was a display. Basically, there were switches you would flip back and forth to program things. Joshua may not be picked up. <laughs> Three up, two down. Well, yes, we um, and that was it. I think uh, I was on mute because um, I was in the washroom. Uh, what I was familiar with growing up was seeing. Uh, like, um, this looks almost like my friend's uh, stove that I remembered seeing at his house that had lots of extra little clocks, I always thought. And they were um, the use of analog devices to be able to turn on your, um, your oven and have it turn off. And today, in 2019, they actually sell ovens with Android uh, computers built right in. So you can turn on your oven straight from your smartphone app. A lot of people here may be familiar with um, the increasing use of automatic electronic devices like Mr. Coffee, um, which was made possible by the transistor ship making things smaller and smaller. And thus you could have your flaked coffee. In the mid-70s, the Scottish company came up with a protocol that they called X10, which was supposed to um, provide communication through the, the uh, household. But basically, even up until the 1970s, no device could work with devices from another manufacturer. So it was um, sort of a fractured world or, or infrastructure. Um, but uh, this company uh, that made this X10 thing, um, it was sold through like Radio Shack and other places. And I was, it was cool seeing uh, some of these old pictures of uh, consoles where you could press buttons and they would use a type of radio frequency to control the devices in your house so you could dim the lights but um, overall it was fairly limited what it could do. That is true. Uh, I found a pretty cool video so um, we'll have a link up to it on the, the, the website where um, Somebody looked at some of the PC software that was available in, I think, 1982 to help control your X10 command household. Um, what was... Don't know if that got stuck, but anyway. Um, what I was most familiar with in the 1980s was still seeing intercom systems in some of the people's houses. Um, I'm going to check to see. Uh, but uh, so like um, in the 70s, they had intercom households. And I remember that they were pretty uniformly terrible with really tinny um, sound. And um, I happened to find some fun photos of 1980s updated models that had cassette players so you could listen to pretty poor audio quality out of the mono speaker built into your wall. Um, 
from the 1970s. So like uh, moving on, basically, uh, um, we start getting to uh, electronics devices in the 80s, like VHS players and um, Betamax players. And all these use infrared light to control um, the remote controls. And so what became popular was basically systems that uh, would have a little command module, and then you would buy a really expensive remote, which would um, tell the command module, to, uh, which was all connected with little wires to infrared lights, um, so that when you hit the remote, it would go flash little infrared lights directly into your VHS to get it going. Um, starting in the 2000s is when we started to have cheaper communication protocols like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And um, that's really the beginning of the modern era of being able to remote control your house. And so we've got it to the point now where um, geeks and nerds are playing around. So I found a couple examples. Like on the left here is somebody made a cat feeder that they can control through a smartphone app and that's wired into their internet. Um, <clears throat> On the right, somebody took one of those tinny little intercom speakers and, and hooked it up to a, um, a tiny little computer. Uh, the most popular way for people to build these types of systems is something called a Raspberry Pi um, mini computer, which are as cheap as $25 or $30. And I think uh, Mark Clark in particular has played with one. Um, so the idea of automating your home became more and more popular, and I didn't know what it was in 2014. It just sort of exploded. Uh, one, I think the X10 company fizzled out in the mid, uh, right around 2010. And so it seemed like Apple, Amazon, and Google all kind of had their idea, or their eye on jumping into this space. Um, so uh, going back real quick. Apple's name for their system is something called HomeKit. And then Google came out with something called Home, and Amazon came up with this whole thing called Alexa. Um, and uh, credit really goes to Amazon that they were the first to the market. They came up with this little cylinder that had a speaker in it and microphones, so you could have Amazon listening to every conversation in your house. And back in 2014, I thought, who's ever going to buy this thing? Um, it was clearly mainly there so that you could put it in there and tell Amazon to, to buy more stuff through Amazon. Um, but I got to give it, I got to hand it to Amazon that they, these things kind of caught on and people found it really fun. Um, especially, uh, I've noticed like, uh, like little kids playing around and asking the, the Amazon Alexa to tell jokes and things like that. Um, and Amazon themselves were very aggressive about expanding the market. So they provided tools for programmers to just jump right in and, and link their existing electronic systems in. Um, Apple and Google took more of their time. Uh, their, there's, they're more software companies, so they had the software ready to go on the phones, but what you could do was more limited. Like, um, so if you wanted to control something in your home on your iPhone, you had to go to an app directly on the phone and push buttons. And it was, I think, two years or so before Apple came out with their HomePod, um, Google came out with their Google Home, and, uh, oops, Amazon still had their Echo. And um, we have seen um, problems have come. Like, uh, there's been news stories about how there's been hacks and breaches of security. And um, that may be related to the way that both Amazon and Google were quick to um, kind of throw the doors wide open. and. Um, Apple, meanwhile, was kind of criticized that they'd come out with this home kit, but there wasn't much you could buy for it. And then stories came out that the people making devices were sort of irritated because Apple's standards for security were super high, and they wanted this, um, this intense security on the Bluetooth chips, which the first generation of Bluetooth chips were really slow. And so 
some of the early devices were criticized that like you could tell your front door to unlock and it could take up to 40 seconds before the device would respond. Uh, but thankfully, newer equipment has come along and better chips. So things are getting better and better. Um, I would have thought Google would have been better at security um, because they're a smart company with smart people. But I still found lots of articles talking about major security breaches that they have too. Did I go backwards? Okay. Um, and for what it's worth, this was kind of a banner year for Apple with their home kit. Um, every year in January, there's something called the Consumer Electronics Show. And uh, all the TV manufacturers and electronics manufacturers come around and show their products. And Apple apparently, even though they weren't at the show, it's very apparent that they had been working behind the scenes to integrate with a lot of the manufacturers. So there was a lot of announcements of different devices, including, much to my surprise, the fact that Sony and LG and Samsung are now starting to build um, uh, some of the HomeKit stuff, some of the iTunes AirPlay, um, right into their smart TVs. So um, uh, th this is just sort of a little quick um, overview of some of the types of things that are available, like TVs, speakers, lights, switches, outlets. We have a little bit to show tonight, and, but like I said, um, there were some security implications. So Charles first is just going to show us real quick how he uses HomeKit or um, home automation in his house, and then Steve will talk afterwards, and then we'll look at some stuff. Well, now, hang on here, flag. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and move this sideways. Okay. Okay, so I'm here and at home, my smart thermostat tracks my power usage and how much is going on. The orange is this last year, the gray is the year before, so that it shows what kind of percentages that are going on. Uh, now you might ask, what does this mean? It means that 54 hours less heating, guess what? We're having the mildest winter in years. So it's accounted for, but you get to see what it means for your service. Now, this is kind of fun because I'm going to go out of this. I'm going to go to my thermostat. Come on. Had it a minute ago. We promise, folks. Well, I'm on the. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> okay, so right now at my house, it's 72 degrees in the hallway where the thermostat is. That means it's usually two to three degrees colder in the living room. So. Normally when I go away, I set it down to like 68, but I left it up tonight so that I could reset it here at the meeting. So if I want my thermostat to go down to 68, I just tell it to go down to 68 and I hit submit. And that's all I really have to do when I get home the temperature will be set for 68. And it will hold that 
until 11 p.m., where it automatically goes to 68 degrees. So, uh, basically, uh, I can bring up a menu. I can set each day individually if I want to. When the cooling or heating comes on, when it goes off, uh, I can set, I leave the house and have it drop a temperature there and go back and forth. So I'm happy with the schedule that's there, so I'm just going to say done. But it's, it's that easy. If I wanted to cool the house, I would just press the cool button and set, make sure the temperature was set for however I wanted the house cool to, and that would be it. So this is a, just a really simple standalone kind of thing that all you need is the right thermostat and to download the app from the App Store. So, you know, a $125 thermostat gives you the ability to change your temperature sitting in the living room when you don't want to get up and walk down the hall. <laughs> so, that's it for my little demo. But we just wanted to show something simple. Yeah, Laurel. Huh? I can do it from my iPad or my phone. I don't need any complexity in my life. <laughs> okay. I will turn off the mute. I will go mute mine then. Ooh, I hope I didn't mess up the screen flow. All right. I get to play bad cop. Woohoo! So HomeKit. You know what it is now? It's a it's it's an ecosystem for it's Apple's ecosystem for devices to talk with each other and to talk through hubs to uh, uh, you know, build a control, command and control, uh, garage doors, sprinklers, all that kind of stuff. Um, don't do it. Uh, that's the end of my talk. No. Um, <laughs> I, I'm normally, uh, if, if anyone knows me, I'm the first adopter of everything, all that kind of stuff. And I can tell you, as you get into your 50s, this stuff starts to become a pain in the neck. Um, because uh, it's, it's not that it's complicated, it's just that you're adding more sophistication to your house, which means more maintenance to your house. Um, so if you like to be able to turn on and off your lights, you have to make decisions about what light switches you're gonna buy. Um, some light switches are Wi-Fi uh, connected to, to, your, to your home. So that sounds great. You know, I can just use Wi-Fi, it's all secure. You put 15 Wi-Fi switches in your house, and then you decide to change your Wi-Fi password. Well, enjoy your weekend. Um, it's, it's, it's even worse when you have, uh, like, uh, I, I, my, my Nest Protect uh, uh, thermo, uh, smoke detectors are not HomeKit compatible, unfortunately. None of the Nest stuff is. We'll talk about that. Um, but they're all way up ladder high ceiling. And again, if I want to change the, the Wi-Fi password, I got to get up on a ladder and press a button and reset everything, right? So you have to start thinking about, like, what am I doing to my house here? It's like my Mac is bad enough when I get a new version of, of the operating system. Is my house going to work? Um, so wait, what, what, don't use it? This stuff sounds great. Well, Apple is behind, as Jojen talked about. They were the last to the party, and they're trying to catch up. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it means that uh, you can't go buy a, a Haiku fan that works with HomeKit, even though they've been promising it for three years. Uh, some of this is technical. Uh, the complicated security that Apple uh, pushed on people, which was good, required a hardware chip to do all of that in, encryption and decryption. And so people didn't want to pay the money or to put this chip in when Amazon's and Google's was software only. So last summer, 
With iOS 11, Apple introduced the software-only version of home, HomeKit security, but the adoption rate is still slow for some people. They just don't want to support it because they don't see it's worth their benefit when Amazon owns like so much of the market share right now. The problem with Amazon is that, as Joshin pointed out, they're kind of the wild, wild west, and they don't, they're not really privacy and uh, security focused. So for example, with Amazon, there was a problem recently in Germany where a, um, a support person, someone called in and said, I want to get my audio from like the last two months. So Amazon's recording all this audio and storing it. So the support person gave them access to all their audio and actually gave them access to 1,700 people's other, other people's audio. So all your stuff is getting recorded. Now, Apple doesn't work that way. HomeKit is not as sophisticated as, as uh, um, Alexa and Google Home, but it's very private and secure, so that's good. But now you have to deal with this stuff. Who's listening to me? Does Apple have a bug? Do I got a malware on my HomePod? It's like someone, you know, all this nonsense. So, so that's another problem. Um, HomeKit is adopted last, so that means like typically when stuff comes out, it's for Amazon first, maybe Google, um, and then uh, maybe, maybe we get home, HomeKit support, maybe we don't. That is picking up, but it's still way behind. Um, and HomeKit can be buggy. Uh, there's many, we, have a, we use HomeKit for our garage door. So why did I switch over to this other than just being a geeky, cool thing to do? Um, it's nice, and if you think about it, you have a car, and in your car is a button that you press to open your garage door. How many people's door from the garage into their house is locked? One person. Because what? You open the garage door, you want to get in your house, right? So it's unlocked. So in your car that you parked at the mall is your registration where you live and a key that you press a button to get in your house. We've been doing this for decades and it sounds kind of stupid when you think about it. So HomeKit gets around that because now my garage door is open, is controlled through HomeKit. Um, and so it's kind of cool that I can go, you know, I go to my phone, I go, hey, dingus, to open the garage door, and the garage door opens and closes. That works great, except for when the app, for whatever reason, can't talk to the Apple TV, which is the hub, and it sits there updating. So you're trying to get into your damn house, and it's updating, and you're forced quitting the app, and you're doing all this nonsense. Another fun one is with CarPlay, they have, Apple's rightfully so very secure conscious. So you plug your phone in, and in your CarPlay, you can't, use the, you can't use Siri in your car to open your door. It says you need to unlock your phone first, which is not something you should be doing while you're driving. So, so they don't, that way, if someone breaks into your car and you left your phone in there, that they can't open up your, your doors, right? That's good. Um, the Apple Watch, however, is secure. Like, as soon as you unlock it on your phone, it's secure. So you can raise your, your watch and say, hey, dingus, open the garage door, and it'll open the garage door, even while you're driving, right? You kind of have to play the game like, you know, do I look at the watch to see if it lit up or whatever, but if you hit someone, who cares? Um, <laughs> so that all sounds great, except for, and this is not just me, this happens about 80% of the time, I leave my garage, I get in my car, I back out of the, out of the garage, I get into the driveway, I have a, I'm looking at an Eero router that I've got like right above my, which I bought to try and improve this problem and didn't fix it, and I use my watch and I'm like, hey dingus, close the garage door, and it sits there and says, I'll tap you when I'm ready. And you wait like 15 seconds and it's like, sometimes it, then it starts closing the door. Other times it says, uh, neither me or the iPhone could talk to your device or whatever. And you try it again and sometimes it works or it doesn't. And what I figured out with people is that this is part of Apple's like battery management where when you're at home, they're not spinning up radios and stuff like that. And then you get out to the garage and you've got, it's, it's connected to the Wi-Fi router that's in the far side of the house and it hasn't really reconnected to the closer Eero yet, and it's not using Bluetooth yet, and so it's trying to negotiate all this stuff, and meanwhile, you're sitting for 25 seconds waiting for your damn garage door to close. Um, it works almost 100% coming home. So when I come home and pull in the driveway, it'll almost always open the door, and that's because the watch has had enough time to time out, like being away from the house, it's not connected to Wi-Fi, and it started talking to the phone over Bluetooth, right? Is this sounding fun yet, right? So. So it's, it's all cool stuff, but it's not perfect. It's not like, it's not ubiquitous. And so it works most of the time, but not all the time. And you know, like when you flip a light switch, you want your light switch to work, right? When you want, you know, so, so that's the downside compared to a garage door opener, which typically works whenever you press the button, right? So it can be buggy. Um, there are no industry standards. 
So, you know, X10 was trying to be an industry standard, but Apple's got their thing, Google's got their thing, Alexa's got their thing. This is beta and VHS all over again. So are, if you're gonna invest in $1,000 worth of switches and lights and all that other kind of stuff, is it gonna work in five years? Is Apple gonna punt on it? Is Google gonna punt on theirs? Is Amazon gonna go like, you know what, we've been losing money on this Alexa stuff for so long, whatever, we're not gonna do it anymore. You know, and so now you're like, buying extra Alexas and putting them in the closet just in case yours dies. And then, oh, they shut down the server so you can't talk to your door anymore, you know, and you get the toilet paper you can't buy. I don't know, it's like, so, so you build this whole world up and it all comes crashing down because like there's a, a problem with your Wi-Fi router or whatever. Um, so none of these things are compatible. Some devices do support multiple platforms. So like the, the Haiku fans, which, I, which are really nice fans and I want to buy, support Alexa and Google Home, but they don't support HomeKit yet. And I've told them time and time again, I'm not going to buy your product until you support HomeKit. And, um, but on the other hand, uh, I bought Lutron switches. So Lutron switches use this, this technology called Zigbee to talk to each other, which isn't quite as secure, but I only use it for light switches, so I don't really care. But the, adv the advantage they have is that I don't have to change the Wi-Fi password. It's just, it's just its own protocol. Those Zigbee switches talk to a little box, which I have in my closet, which is plugged into Ethernet into the switch. So I have, a, I have 32, 32 ports of switches now to plug all these things in, right? And um, so I got a bridge, and that bridge has got firmware that needs to be updated. And now my garage door has firmware that needs to be updated. And I've got two apps to run the garage. You know, so it's like, oh, gosh. Um, so there's all this stuff, right? So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there's some issues we've been talking about. Um, what happens when software updates your, uh, your Apple TV or your HomePod? So to use this stuff inside the house, it just works over Wi-Fi. If you want to do what Charles kind of did, you have to have a cloud presence. As much as Charles hates clouds, he's using a cloud whenever he talks to his, his HomeKit or he talks to his, his uh, Honeywell. So Apple's uh, um, hubs are the Apple TV version 4 or the HomePod. Either one of those work, right? But I have two Apple TVs and a HomePod. And that took a little bit of while because these were warring brothers, like trying to figure out who's going to control. No, I'm talking to the, no, I'm the home, oh gosh. Trying to figure this stuff out, where the setting is to turn it off. And it's like, that was another day of time wasted uh, figuring that nonsense out. Um, the HomeKit app can get stuck updating as we talked about. And um, will the hardware remain compatible? So I, again, I have a little bridge for my, for my garage door opener. I have a bridge for my light switches. If you, if you then buy uh, Hue lights, because those are cool, you'll have a bridge for that. If you buy Wemo lights, you'll have a bridge for that. So you've got four bridges that you're plugging in and doing all this stuff. And, and then, oh, iOS 13 came out, and oh, well, my light switches don't work anymore. Now what do I do, right? Um, the one, I will say as a plug for the Lutron uh, Casita switches, they work perfectly fine as manual switches. They're, they're designed as like regular, you can go up and down and dim and things like that. And they've got remotes that you buy from them that you can, uh, used to remotely control the switches. So I went with that route, so that way if the whole HomeKit automation thing like goes tanks out, my switches still work, right? Um, so so plan, plan, and if you're gonna get into this stuff, plan for the future, because um, it may be ugly. Um, you gotta manage these hubs, you gotta manage these bridges, you gotta manage the devices. Here's my house, I got a garage door bridge, a Lutron bridge, two Apple TVs, a HomePod, 12 switches, six smoke detectors, and a thermostat. You know, and I'm updating one of them at least every month. Right, um, But I say all this because normally we're up here talking about how awesome everything is, and it's, this stuff is not 100% awesome yet. So just if you're going to do it, go in knowing that you're going to maybe have to do some maintenance and, 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 and upkeep on this stuff. Um, it's not just HomeKit that has problems. We have an Amazon uh, Ring doorbell. We love it. I bought it in December. Uh, it's awesome. Elizabeth can like see who's at the door without answering the door. Uh, we get cat videos all the time now because it sees every cat that uses our porch as a thoroughfare. Um, but, uh, but it turns out that they've been uploading the video totally unencrypted and allowing anyone to look at the video, right? So that's a privacy issue. If you live alone, if you live alone at home single, you know, and some hacker gets at this video and starts saying, I know when you're home and I know when you're not, and I'm gonna post that on blah, 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 if you don't send me a thousand Bitcoin or whatever. Now all of a sudden, your life's got all this extra stress you didn't need, you know, for your, for your doorbell. So, so these are issues that we're, we're gonna to continue to struggle with for, I think, quite a while, until we figure out the security thing once and for all, and everyone gets on the same boat and has all the same rules, and everything is like going through some sort of regulated standard about how this stuff should work. 
Um, right now, it's just a bunch of engineers who are super energetic and young, building all this stuff as fast as they can. And Google is making new stuff and shutting it down as fast as they make it. Um, so, so just be aware of this kind of stuff that, you know, some of the things that you can be introducing, in, introducing into your life. Um, so, however, if you must, if you think it's still awesome, um, after you see all the stuff that we show you, um, what are some of the good stuff? HomeKit's very secure. We talked about that. They take privacy uh, very seriously. Um, HomeKit is actually fairly simple to use when you're setting up devices. I say fairly simple because sometimes it's, uh, anytime you have a system where you have multiple manufacturers involved, Apple can set up rules, but it's, it's up to the, the delivery of the other uh, party to also make it work. So for example, I have an Ecobee thermostat, and I bought the Ecobee because it is HomeKit compatible. It also has little sensors that I can buy and put around the house that are battery operated, so it can kind of adjust the temperature based on the average temperature, and it can track where you are and stuff, and that works okay, not great, but it works. Um, and so the way it works is you, you get this thing, you mount it to your wall, and you set it up for HomeKit, and you have to, you have to go through this god-awful menu system to find it, and it puts a little bark, a code on the screen, and you take your home app, and you use the camera, and it scans it, and it does this magic thing where it sees the code, and boom, you're online. Oh, that was fantastic. And then three weeks later, like, it's not working anymore. And you're like, well, how do I reset the HomeKit? How do I get rid of this thing? Well, the only way I fi ever figured out how to do it was to literally pull it off the wall. That was, there's no UI inside the thermostat to reset the home kit or to delete it and start over. You literally have to like disconnect it from the wall, plug it, unplug it from the pin so it reboots. And that's the only, so it's, so it's stuff like that, right? Now other devices are much better, like my Lutron switches, I don't have a problem, it's just a bridge and I just scan it and if I want to erase it, I just erase it out of the home app and add it again and it comes back and it works, right? But I guess the point is that some of these devices can be really tedious to set up, and for the most part, Apple re requires, you to have, requires them to have a code on the device and on the box that you buy, and you just scan it with the Home app. Um, the Home app's not that great. Um, it leaves a lot to be desired. You kind of have to like, go through and kind of figure it out, um, but maybe Apple will get there someday. Um, and HomeKit is controlled by Apple. So the, the, the cons of the walled garden are, I think, pros in this case, is that they're trying to aim you know, all these manufacturers down certain roads. And that's honestly one of the reasons why we don't have more manufacturers, because they don't want to play that game. But Apple's like, if you want in our garden, you've got to follow these rules. And I think that's good. Whereas I think with the Alexa and the Google world, anyone who signs a paper and gives them money for licensing is in. And who knows what you're getting? Who knows what the quality of the chips are in those devices? Who knows if people are hacking those from the remote you know, outside world or whatever? And so it's, that's, that's definitely a world I don't want to be in, is the, the non-HomeKit world. Um, so uh, Laura brought up a question about automation. One of the things I really like about HomeKit is automation. So one of the things you can do um, with your, your iCloud account in general is you can set up a family account. So you can, like, like I'm the owner of, of our family account, and my wife is, is, is considered a parent. We don't have any kids, but if they're a parent, that means they can buy stuff and whatever without my permission, right? And so they set, so Apple added this a couple of years ago for things like your app store, so you can share your apps. And, you know, and then if you have kids, you can like give your kids an allowance and they can buy stuff or whatever, and things like that. But if you set that up in your iCloud, if you set up a family and add your spouse to the fam family, then you can use that in HomeKit, in the automation. So just literally yesterday, my wife set up this automation on her own and I never showed her how to do any of this kind of stuff. And she's not dumb, but she does, this is not her forte. She doesn't like, you know, it, she's more of a turn the light switch on and off kind of person. Um, uh, so she set up an automation that, and, and these are canned automations. Like these are, it, HomeKit is nowhere near as flexible as Alexa. Alexa, you can add software from anybody into your system and have it do all sorts of stuff. Apple defines what you can do. So they have an action called when the first person arrives home. And then she set a setting on that setting called only at night, and she's like, turn the kitchen lights on to 50%. And so now, whenever she comes home, because like I'm at PMUG, she goes out to dinner, she comes back, the kitchen lights will already be on. Now we're talking, this automation replaces going through the door and doing this, <laughs> right? But it's awesome because your lights are on when you get home. Now we also have this one. This one we've been using for over a year. When the last person leaves, run the scene, we gone. 
So what We Gone does is it turns off all the lights downstairs and some other things, but it's different than our good night scene, which shuts down a lot of things, right? Um, and so, th so what this is doing is this is using the iPhone of the, it, it only works with the iPhones, because they've got to have cellular connection, of the, of the family members. <laughs> And when the last person leaves, it shuts off all the lights. So we can walk out of the house and know the lights are off. Uh, we have a sunrise daily, which turns our porch lights off. We have a sunrise, you know, and we have an opposite one that turns the porch lights on. So we control all of that. And the beauty of this, different than, say, buying a light that just does it on its own, is that we can see the status of it when it works, and we, we can manually control it. So if you're on vacation, you can kind of just mess with it. Yes, you know, once in a while you just turn your lights off and then turn them back on, you know, like at dinner or whatever. And so that way if someone's like looking at the house or whatever, you're going like, oh, stuff's happening, right? Um, we, also, we also do this with our cat sitter. So when, our cat, when, we when, we, when we're on vacation, we have a cat sitter, we have other automations that are disabled that will turn on extra lights and stuff like that at nighttime for the cat sitter, like, you know, living room lights and things like that. Because guess, guess what? The cat sitter doesn't know which one of the three banks of switches is the, the coat closet light. We do. Right? So when she comes in at night, the lights are already on. Doesn't even have to mess with it, right? Um, so there's a number of things that we can do. The, the other th reason that we got the garage door opener, honestly, um, with HomeKit is not just to be able to replace the security aspects, but um, we're both the type of people that if we get three blocks away and go like, did we close the garage door? We got to drive back to, close, to see if we close the garage door, right? We now get a push notification on the phone that the garage door closed, right? So I'm pulling away and I get about a block away and it comes down and it says your garage door was closed and I go like, great, I'm done, right? I move on. If, we're, if we have a question about it, you know, we can, do, uh, we can check it. Um, also, like if, if, if there is an issue with the house when we're on vacation and someone needs to get in that doesn't have a key, you know, we can come over, they can call us and we can say we're at the house and I can push a button and I can open the garage door for them and then they can get in the house. Um, so those are the kind of things. So, you know, you're trying to poo-poo on it just to set people's expectations right, that this stuff is not like smooth sailing. There's going to be stuff happening. There's going to be, you know, like, like I said, you get a new, ver why, why can't I see my Apple TV? For like a month, I couldn't see, it's like, I can't see your Apple TV. Well, I don't know why you can't, I can see it, it's right there, right? And so you're rebooting things and turning them on and off. And it turned out that both my, like I said, my, both my Apple TVs had decided they wanted to control HomeKit. And they're warring with each other. And I had to find the option in the HomeKit app, which was not easy to say, this is the only thing that, this Apple TV is the only one that controls my, my, uh, my set. And the, pro the reason I couldn't find it for the longest time is because I thought it, it had a checkbox saying your Apple TV is your hub. But it wasn't the device Apple TV, it was the, it was the one upstairs that was still named Apple TV. And the one downstairs was called 4K Apple TV. And so it was like, your Apple TV is controlling your, I'm like, it's, I'm rebooting and it's not working, but it's the, the damn one upstairs. So, so name your Apple TVs. <laughs> Call them gym or living room or whatever, but don't leave them named Apple TV because you'll be confused later when the software is like, like lying to you. Um, so, so it's stuff like that, right? It's like, it's not major stuff, but whatever you do, whatever you invest in, make sure it's gonna work if HomeKit shuts down. Make sure your thermostat will still work, that you can still use your thermostat if HomeKit shuts down. Whatever system you invest in, make sure all that stuff still functions, because otherwise it's all going to be bricks and you're going to be throwing it away. So that's my talk. So I heard this Facebook story, I don't know if it's true or not, where the couple split up, but he had administrative rights and wasn't living there anymore and was harassing his ex by turning on and off lights. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it happened to me. It's, if you want to go ahead and try all this fun stuff, we have some devices here, and I granted access to my housemate, and uh, the first thing he did was try it out by going, <laughs> and the, the lights in the living room came on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. Uh, he's since stopped that harassing behavior, so I don't have to block him on Facebook or anything. <laughs> That's true, but then I couldn't enjoy it. Um, so as Steve was saying, there is a home app um, that will run on Mojave. And um, it's basically just sort of a port of the iPad app. 
Um, let's see. Two accessories not responding. Is that because they're here? That is true. Um, I was trying to figure out the best way to show it. Um, you need a Vanna White. I do. I'm going to switch so you won't get a screen recording of this right now. Photos app doesn't turn. That's too bad. Um, then I guess we'll try it this way. Um, so what I have brought today is a HomePod. One. Um, so this is the Eve. Um, what they call the degree, and it's a little portable thermostat. Hey, um, not easy to read. I thought there was a flip too. Anyway, um, it's a little uh, cube, and on it it reads the humidity and the temperature and the barometric <laughs> pressure. Oh wait, show show the bottom of it because it shows that code I was talking about right there. Okay, so. Um, as Steve was saying, every HomeKit device has, uh, has to have a little code printed on it. And so if I were setting up the device, what I did on the phone originally was I launched the Home app. I told it I wanted to add a new device. And then I just held the little um, code there. And then the, the Home application saw it, read the numbers, and then added it to my home. And so the, what I have this for is I leave it in the bedroom because at, uh, during the summertime I really like to have the windows open and I have fans that come on um, and it's usually boiling hot when I come to bed and then sometime around 2 or 3 in the morning the room is cold, cooled off so much that I get really cold. And so one of the things I was using was to have the, um, an automation that when the temperature falls below a certain uh, temperature at night to turn off the fans in the bedroom. And I did that using one of these switches, um, which I don't know an easy way to show. Um, it's over here. And um, one of the things I liked about this brand, which was called iDevices, was that there's a physical switch on it. So I can even, um, even if there's something's going wrong, I can reach over and still touch the plug and turn it on. And there's a little night light. I can take a picture of it, and that'll show up. Because you're still, the camera's still up on the screen. That one. Yeah. yeah. Let's hope it doesn't break. Over, over here, front and center, we have the iDevices switch, and uh, this one is called Joshin's Light. And one of the things I have it set for is this other thing I have is um, it's called an Eve door, and it's just a little magnetic switch. And so um, uh, one side attaches to my door, and the other side attaches to the door frame. And so when it's on, um, let's see. Uh, a little red light lets you know when the door has um, closed. And every time I open the door and it's nighttime, this little red light comes on and that signals the system that um, the door opened and it, then, it's, then it's supposed to turn on Joshin's light. Which I can do manually. And I had to bring a little disco light because I didn't want to 
drag a whole thing up tonight. Yeah, it's disappointing that it didn't go right then. Um, one of the other things I brought was a dimmer switch um, that I have not installed in my house yet. And um, just like Steve was saying, one of the things I like about it is that I can still just use it like a regular light switch once it's installed. And I noticed that, um, as uh, Steve was mentioning, you always have to have the little code. And uh, this company included the, a copy of the little code and a little flip out door for setting things up. Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention one of the things about these switches. Um, Joshin was showing it to you. They're both, both the iDevices and the Lutron Casitas are very big boxes. So replacing a three gang was, I had to get an electrician in there to kind of get the wires pushed back and whatnot because I didn't feel comfortable with it. Because the old switches, you know, your standard manual switches, they're really narrow. There's not much hardware to them. But these things have all these electronics in them. So when you're trying to fit three switches in there and all the wiring and everything, it can be a real challenge. So that's one of the things where it's like, I, we're not even considering that when you're like, oh, this is going to replace all my switches. And I, I've still got like 11 switches to do after, a year later. Because I was just kind of like, ah, do, do I really want to get back into that wall and replace that nonsense or whatever? Um, but, uh, um, but in the end, it's, it is kind of nice to be able to like th throw your switches around and stuff like that. And uh, we do have, a, um, we do have a, a, a scene called All On. So if Elizabeth is at home at night or whatever and she sees something, you know, she thinks something's going on, she can just reach over to her phone or just yell, hey, dingus, All On. And all the lights in the entire house will come on. Backyard, front yard, everything, right? <laughs> So it's a security feature to like, you know, say like everything's on. So it's, it's kind of nice. But these are little things you got to look out for. Um, the last thing to show here is sort of one of Apple's little home pods, um, which is just, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of Amazon's little speaker guy. Um, you can talk to it, you can have it, uh, do some basic Siri stuff, and um, in particular, uh, it, its main purpose is as a very good uh, music player. Um, but how, like uh, Steve was saying, I didn't put anything too um, serious with uh, uh, security implications in my house. I basically just have a few light switches and a fan, and then I have, for convenience, a little sensor on the door that tells me when the door has been opened at nighttime and also turns on the light in the living room, um, which is just a little bit more convenient for safety. If a bad guy tries and opens my front door, maybe that'll scare them off if the lights come on right away too. Mm -hmm. um, but for the home pod, let's see if it'll go. Um, hey Siri, play some Rolling Stones. Hey Siri, set the volume to 60%. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop it right now, but what, um, how I just use this in my house was basically um, to control some lights in the living room, to have them come on automatically when it's nighttime and I walk in the door to be able to just say, um, hey Siri, turn out the Joshin's light. Okay. Um, and uh, mostly just to have uh, music to uh, make life more fun. So, um, enjoy music a lot at our house. Um, I saw a couple questions. I saw John's first and then Dennis. Did you ask it how much it um, They. I think they are three fifty, um, which I think is pretty crazy expensive. Um, although they were either fifty or a hundred dollars off on sale during the um, the holidays, um, and everybody keeps saying that maybe Apple will be release, releasing a cheaper one. So we'll see. Yeah, I think they will. They are super expensive, but I will say. The one thing that's awesome about the HomePod is its ability to understand you from like anywhere in the, in the floor that you're at, even when it's playing music. Like one of the things it does is if it's playing the music for you, 
it knows the music that it's playing. So when you yell at it, which is not even really yelling, it's just but elevated voice, it can pick you out over the music because it can subtract the music that it knows it's playing from what it's listening to. And so, um, so there's some times where it's, it's just nice to be able to like say, hey, Dingus, you know, we, have a, we have a scene for, called television, which turns off, we have an open floor plan. And so our television uh, scene will turn off all the downstairs lights, including the ones behind the couch, which shine in the TV, and then set the living room lights to like 50% uh, or 60%, some kind of lower temperature. So you can just yell at that. The other thing that's super nice is that when you're chasing the cat around because she needs her medication, and you finally catch her upstairs, and it's all dark downstairs, you got the cat in your arms, you can just say, hey, dingus, turn on the downstairs lights. And if you organize everything, the whole, all the downstairs lights come on. And so it's one less thing to mess around with if you're like dealing with stuff. This is coming really handy when your hands are full. Like you've got like, you know, like heavy bags of litter or whatever. I mean, I'm literally talking about stuff that I've done. And I can just say, hey, turn on the lights. And the lights come on, and I don't have to sit there and muck, muck with it. So it's not a major thing. It's a small quality of life. But this speaker, this, the microphones in this, it sounds really good too. The micro, microphones are fantastic. I've been really impressed at how well this thing can hear me and understand me. That is true. Um, what uh, Dennis was saying was um, that uh, if, you have, if you have the money to buy two of these, you can have them run in stereo, um, which is something that uh, I've heard is very nice. People uh, may remember um, uh, the THX logos that used to play before some of the, the big blockbuster movies of the and like uh, Apple actually has hired Tom Homlinson of the THX um, sound people and he's been working with engineering on the audio and I think on all of Apple's products including the new iPads and uh, even the new um, iMacs and stuff, the sound is, is quite a bit better than it used to be. Um, we'll try and experience. I'm very happy now that uh, the little um, light did start responding. I don't know if we can see. It's hard to see the color exactly, but um, on uh, this little switch, it had a little night light on it. And um, I can um, turn the night light on or off, and you can even adjust the color and the brightness of the night light. And then maybe this will work this time where when the door sensor um, senses that the door is closed and then it gets suddenly opened at nighttime. Hopefully, I got some disco lights. Yay! <laughs> Um, just like uh, Steve was saying, I liked how on the um, home kit you can program some automation. So um, we have a, hey Siri, good night. And that should turn out the lights. Um, the scene is set. It good might night. have just turned out the lights in the living room uh, <laughs> on my wife too. But, um, I warned her this might happen. <laughs> This is why I'm not doing a live demo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna play the music again. Um, will you try a command? Yeah! Hey Siri, pause. Hey Siri, play some Weird Al Yankovic. Did I get that? It's, it's uh, thinking. Playlist Weird Al Yankovic now playing. Yes, I have yeah. an actual playlist. Yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> and try uh, a weather hey. or something. Hey Siri, what time is it? It's 20.55. And then you can set this up to like work with your messages and your phone messages hey, Siri, and stuff pause. like that. Um, what were you saying? You can set it up to like read your messages and things like that, but it only works for one member of your home. They don't have voice recognition yet. So if you're a single person, that's great. 
but if you've got a family, then it's kind of useless because the other person can't use it. HomePod. That's HomePod. Yeah. Um, it's usually Apple Music. Um, I have both. Uh, I have a whole bunch of CDs that I bought that, uh, or even mixtapes that friends made that I added to my iTunes library, and those play through it as well. Um, but that's all uploading through Apple Music, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, through uh, an iTunes match. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the the maybe the biggest differentiator between Apple and the other services is that. A lot of those have advertising supported features. Um, they, uh, they oftentimes have more flexibility and can run more stuff, but um, you'll hear a lot more things with ads. With Apple, you sort of pay, but you get a cleaner experience without ads. Um, so what Steve was talking about, I subscribe to the Apple Music service, and one nice thing is that um, you can ask for an incredible array of music that's sold through the Apple Store, like. Um, I was surprised, like, uh, hey Siri, play Del Kosh. Like, Playing Del Kosh. My wife is Iranian, and it was, it was finding even like a lot of obscure Iranian music, which I didn't expect at first. So kudos to Apple on that for their music so, uh, variety. Yes? Oh, they got it all. It's like, it's ridiculous now to be fair. You know, like they're trying to, they're, that's, it's one of the things that manufacturers are starting to use as upsell, you know, to like, like I couldn't replace my last refrigerator because the new one came with a, with, with, a, with a Google integration like screen and everything. And I didn't want any of that nonsense. And so it's becoming kind of a problem. Um, but yeah, a lot of appliances are starting to add like, uh, not necessarily home kit, but like app support. Like, so when you're in the house, Again, this is one of those kind of things you might find like an appliance with Alexa support, but not HomeKit support and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't see myself wanting to use those particular features because uh, I never leave the house when something is running like that. But what would be nice is to get a notification on my phone when the washer or dryer is done and I'm downstairs and I can't hear the tune or whatever, right? So that might be kind of a nice feature. But, um, but in terms of like HomeKit support, uh, you know, it, it, it might be interesting with, as Joshin mentioned earlier, having Samsung and those guys start to plug those features into the television is really important. I mean, this is a bad thing for all of us. My, my TV starts telling me ads, like when I turn my TV on, it says, by the way, we've got this other channel where you can go buy and watch a movie. And I'm like, get out of my face, right? So this is not a good trend. They're only doing this to make money. Um, but on the other hand, getting getting Apple Music and iTunes movies and things like that, because Apple is going to be coming out with a subscription service. I mean, bar none, they're just building up the content now. That'll be Netflix-like. And so the question is, which ones are you going to subscribe for? There was a joke recently on The Simpsons where Homer was vetting, writing you know, reviews of, of TV shows and movies and stuff like that, and the Google Disney conglomerate brought him in and said, why do you stop doing this? And he's like, there's 500 new shows every month and people only have time to watch 300. And, um, and, and they're like, well, we don't care. We only want them to subscribe because of one. Everything else is all junk. We don't care if they watch it or not. We just want them to subscribe, right? And so once they subscribe, we only got to do one good show. Everything else can stink, but they'll think they can watch all this other stuff someday, but they never will, right? And so with Disney and NBC just announced the streaming service and all this other kind of stuff, it's very important for Apple to be on the television. Netflix is so far ahead that I think my LG TV actually has a Netflix button on the remote. You know, so you press that and it launches the app and you can watch Netflix on the TV. So, um, so this is a big, big, big thing. And um, Apple's, like I said earlier, Apple's way behind. Um, and so it, it concerns me a little bit about the uptake of their compatible devices compared to the other um, options out there. But who knows? We'll see. Hopefully slow and steady will win the race, and hopefully that'll bring you coming back each month. Uh, next month we are planning to cover backup again, and we'll be raffling off, um, we'll, we'll have some uh, hard drives to give away so nobody has an excuse not to be doing backup. 
and we actually have a couple um, uh, codes to give away for the super duper backup program for people who don't have any backup software yet. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you always be able to do that. I saw Laurel's hand and then that's, that's, Fred's hand. That's pretty smart. Oh yeah, it's so so I I Nest was kind of like the first smart thermostat, and so I bought one of those. But I backed and then I also got my Nest Protects. But because of the warring factions, Nest doesn't support HomeKit. It's only Google Home, and so I got rid of my Nest thermostat and went with the Echobee for HomeKit. But one of the features I lost when I did that was the, um, the interaction between the smoke detectors and more importantly, the CO2 detectors and the, the furnace. So one of the things Nest offers is if you have their whole system, if the, if the, the, the protects notice that the CO2 is going up, they can shut off, the, they'll talk to the thermostat and shut off the furnace. Because that's typically one of the sources of where CO2 will come from, right? And so I lost that ability by going with HomeKit with my thermostat to get the other functionality. And so it's one of these things where you have, when you start having these competing products, I now have kind of a broken system. Um, but there are no HomeKit compatible smoke detectors. The, the, I don't know about the Wi-Fi ones. The Casitas that I bought are about, oh gosh, anywhere from 60 to $80 a switch. Oh, okay. Uh, my Wi-Fi ones were 25. I yeah. think they're 30. Yeah, um, so, um, and th those came with the remote each. So around 50 bucks, I would guess. Last question, and then thank you very much. Yeah. For, for many years, we don't have any home automation, but for many years, when we put the garage door down, we say out loud, garage door going down, and that helps us remember that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Very smart. That is a life hack right there. Hey Siri, <laughs> close my garage door. Oh wait, I don't have one. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I can't see my